So football is where we start this Tuesday edition of the Sportsmax Zone. Only four teams now remain in the Ren Nephew to make a Premier League as Arnett Gardens and Waterhouse on Monday both booked their place in the semi-finals. Arnett needed a 90th minute Fabian Reed winner to win their tie against Portmore United while first half strikes from Javain Brown and Andre Fletcher propelled Waterhouse to victory against Tivoli Gardens. Let's hear what the coaches from both winning teams had to say. Yeah, I mean, unfortunate that we, I mean, we took so long to score, but I'm happy that we got, we, we got the win tonight. Um, I thought, again, we created the opportunities, get some good opportunities to score, and we, we just didn't finish. Um, and I think at times we, we kind of let them in, and, and we're a little bit loose at the back, but thankfully for us, they didn't score, and, and, and then we find the win at the end. <laughs> yeah, we're grateful. Um, we just always take a humble step to everything. And tonight we did that. Uh, I think we took our chances very well. I still think that we had some more chances where we could have capitalised on, but we're still grateful. Yeah, and uh, joining us now to review what happened in the second leg matches last night were Sportsmax football analyst Leger Williams. He was on call for both games and uh, we'll get his thoughts now. Leger, let me start chronologically with the opening game of the evening, Arnett Gardens, um, up against Portmore. Between them, 12 titles. And we heard their coach Xavier Gilbert said that they waited long to get the winner, but it did come in the end. Fabian Reed, what a player! Yeah, he, he's fantastic. You know, when I when I took over from Chris in the game at halftime, you know, I was almost not necessarily hoping that Arne Gans would get the win, but I just expected that he would pop up at some point because he wasn't. Although Arne Gans were creating chances, a lot of them weren't for him. So it was, you know, I didn't really see where he could score. But I, I did have a feeling that he was going to pop up eventually with a goal. And he was tasked to do a lot of different things to what he usually does because of Arnett's change in shape. And I think he worked, his, he worked his socks off. And he said that after the game as well, how hard he worked. He said he worked double hard, you know, you know how he speaks. But yeah, I think he did really well for the game. He led from the front. And it was only right that someone like Fabian Reed could get yet another goal this season. Yeah. And the fact is that these two teams have had pretty solid seasons. Portmore were higher seeded than Arnett Garns based on their regular season performance. But talk to us quickly about how the game played out, given the fact that they had already seen each other in the first leg. And we were assessing when we were previewing this uh, match, Lige, what the coaches may do differently to try to get a result. Was there anything noticeable from your standpoint that you could see the, the coaches trying to, to execute? Yeah, I think both coaches took a different approach to the game. Um, in the second half of the first leg, we saw that Arnett Gardens were trying, as I mentioned on the show last week, that they tried to really clog the centre of the pitch and play through there. I mentioned that they were trying to get as much central progression as, as humanly possible, and that's really what they focused on in the second leg. They didn't start with any wingers on the pitch. They went with a really narrow formation and sometimes it looked like a narrow 4 one 2 one 2 diamond that sometimes it looked like a, you know, a 4 triple 2 So they were playing with you know, a lot of creativity in the middle and they were, every time they got the ball, even at some points, both of their fullbacks were tucking as well. So they were really trying to narrow the pitch. Um, a lot of components of the, the theory of minimum width was used. That's a German philosophy. I know you love that one, Sir Lance. But <laughs> Arne Gardens really tried to play as narrow as possible. That's where a lot of their chances came from in the first half. And even though the, the, the final action and the final piece of quality was lacking, I think for majority of the game, Arne Gardens were on top because of that tactic, because it created so much space out wide. It created so much space for the deeper players as well to play. And it, it, it allowed them to control the tempo. And, you know, in, in the keys to the game, which I spoke about before the, the games began, I mentioned that Arne Gardens, they had to do a couple of things. The keys for Arne Gardens were one, to start fast. They did that really well so they could dictate the tempo of the game. Central progression, they also did that by not starting any wingers and clogging the middle and also to focus the play through Fabian Reed. and he ended up getting the winner. So I think all components of what I expected from Arnett Gardens was exactly what happened and it was also a, a similar tale for Portmore United. I expect them to focus a lot on their box defending. They didn't quite come out as aggressive as they did in the first leg. I think that's notable because they started Siobhan Walsh up top, who we considered to be a, a match winner type, but because they were defending so deep so often, it was very difficult for him to really stay up there and be the impact that he, or have the impact that he usually has. And especially as the game went on, we saw him drop even deeper and deeper for the ball. So he didn't really get many clear-cut chances. And I think overall, Portmore, they weren't 
the best attacking unit. They defended well at times, but I think the pressure was always going to tell and it told in the end and Einer Gains were deserved winners for me. Yeah, when we were previewing the game, we had discussed the fact that as far as Premier League Championship winning experience is concerned, there wasn't very much in, in the game. We said Fabian Reed for Arnett, and I, I neglected to mention that Emilio Rousseau would have played on the 2019 Portmore team as well, so he was there for them. But in essence, a, a lot of young players on show for both teams, and um, a lot of energy, though, and a lot of quality. Do you think it is possible that, that the, 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 the winning Premier League team this, this season could come from these Arnett Gardens players? given what you have seen up to this point. Yeah, I think so, because I mentioned that under the, this INE team can really beat anyone. They're a pretty solid unit. They're well coached as well. I think Xavier Gilbert, you know, acknowledging the fact that he saw a weakness in Portmore, it's very good as a coach to change what your philosophy, yes. not necessarily your philosophy, but what you want to accomplish yeah. under the day at halftime. I think that he did that really well. He gave a lot of trust to a lot of young players as well, as you mentioned. This Arnett team is really young. When you think about how their midfield is made up, you think about Roshane Thompson, Jaheem Thomas, Jamon Shepard, all of those players are under 23, and that's the spine of their team. Kahim Dixon up front as well. It's a really Teenager. young team. Yeah, exactly. So it's a really young team, and he gave them a lot of faith, and they executed for him really well. I do think that this Arnett team, under there, as I said, can beat anyone. It's just whether or not they can put it all together and they'll be coming up against a team that is made up of young players next in Cavalier, yeah. but that the young players for Cavalier aren't necessarily the, the normal young breed. They're a, a, a team that's coached to win and they have a very strict system and I think that places them in pretty good stead going into that game next week. Yeah, and as you touched on Cavalier, so the last time the Junglers won the JPL title would have been in 2016-2017. Um, Xavier Gilbert in his post-match interview was saying that you know he thinks they can break the drought and you mentioned they're up against Cavalier next. What type of football do you expect against Cavalier? And I'm just asking you from the onset, do you think Arnett can overcome Cavalier? Well, I'll have to review a bit more game footage. I like to watch over games before I give my predictions and I can't give them willy-nilly like that, you know. <laughs> but oh, Brent is actually competing for your tag. For your tag. Uh, 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 I mean that's sticky competition because Brent, you know that Brent has his predictions also. But you know, uh, it's tough to have more than one guru. So I, I think I'll have to take it for now. But maybe next season we can see Brent come in and give a real push for me. But yeah, I, I think for the Cavalier tie, I think it's going to be pretty similar to the Portmore tie. Um, this RNA team, they're going to have to really take it from the outset. This Cavalier team is a very comfortable team in a lot of phases of play. So if you want Cavalier to sit back and defend, they'll do that. And that's, I think that's what they're most comfortable doing, sitting back, defending, and then they have one of the most lethal counter-attacking systems in the Jamaica Premier League. But if you want them to take the initiative, they can do that as well. So I think it's going to be very integral to see for Arnett Gardens to see how they can exploit Cavalier from the get-go because they have to be the aggressors, in my opinion, if they're going to get the better of them. And they have the youth, they have... Uh, and although they do have youth, they have youth players that have a lot of experience. So I do think that this Arnett team can get the better of Cavalier, but I said I'll have to review a bit more. Cavalier will have a bit of rest on them as well, yeah. which isn't always the, yes. the best thing in the Jamaica Premier League playoffs. But we're going to have to see how that one plays out. I think it's going to be a good time. Yeah, for now we'll keep it with Waterhouse against Tivoli Gardens. We saw how that one played out. And of course, Waterhouse getting the better of Tivit 2-0. Um, can you say expected result? No, I, I didn't think so. You know, I thought Tivoli would have been the, the team to have the edge here. I think they would have, I thought they would have come out a, a bit better. I, I, I do think that this, you know, there was an injury to one of their key players that came in, one of their few changes from the first leg. And Nikolai Fuller, you know, he had a really bad injury, um, broke his ankle, fractured his ankle actually, very early, early on in the game. It was in the second or third minute of proceeding. So, I think that dented a bit of their momentum early and you know their game plan early so that was a pretty unfortunate blow for Tivoli but even so I don't think that they had a lot of you know focus and they didn't really maintain their usual style of play throughout the first half and you know they made mistakes and they, they were definitely they definitely paid for those mistakes and yeah Waterhouse they did exactly what I thought they would have done as well um, in terms of what I had for them as their keys to the game, I thought they would focus on wide areas. They had they started a lot of attacking players. Their pressing was pretty good. 
not necessarily forcing Tivoli into those mistakes, but because they were so high, they, uh, they could capitalize on those mistakes, and that's what they did. It was two mistakes that led to both Waterhouse goals. Here you see the first one, Penny Cook with an uncharacteristic poor first touch and he really, really gifted Waterhouse that first goal. And the second goal was very similar as well. So, yeah, it was definitely a good performance by Waterhouse. And when they were asked to defend and their goalkeeper, Kemar Foster, was asked to make saves, they did both of those things extremely well. So, it was a deserved win for Waterhouse as well. Yeah, and you see consistency where the goal scorers are concerned. Javine Bryan this season has 16 goals and Andrew Fletcher with 12. How important is it that these key players, these goal scorers, continue with the momentum that they've started with? Yeah, that's extremely important because um, going into the playoffs, Waterhouse had scored, what, 38, 39 goals. And the three, there are three attackers in Fletcher, Rivaldo Mitchell and Javain Bryan had scored 31 of them and it's the, the percentage is even higher now because yeah. that has gone up to 34 out of a possible 41. So they're extremely dependent on these players and these are high quality attacking players. Javain Bryan now the joint highest scorer in the Premier League with 16. Andre Fletcher with 12. He was in the national program when Jamaica played Trinidad not too long ago. So these are some quality attacking players and to get all of them on the field in one go is going to cause any team and I think it might cause Mount Pleasant a bit of problems as well. So it's going to be a tough one but if Waterhouse are going to have any success going forward it's definitely going to be as a big result of those three players. Yeah, a lot of excitement because Mount Pleasant of course topping the table, you know, doing really, really well this season. And of course, they come up against an exciting Waterhouse team. So I think this is a fixture that a lot of people will be turning out to watch. Yeah, I think so as well. But I think it's pretty, I think you have to look at it based on what we saw during the regular season. Uh, I think Waterhouse saw a weakness in Tivoli and that's why they really attacked them. They really went for the win from the half. They were extremely aggressive and that's not what we saw from Waterhouse in the regular season because when they played Mount Pleasant twice, it was two 1-0 victories for Mount Pleasant and Mount Pleasant really managed those games really well. So it's, it's going to be two tight games. I don't think it's going to be that, you know, some excellent free-flowing football, that some attacking football. But I, I do think those games are going to be very closely contested. But it's going to be really interesting to see what Waterhouse and Marcel Gale come up with to try and counteract what Mount Pleasant do really well. Yeah, and, and, and Lish, how expectant should the Waterhouse fans be? Because outside of the last, the previous two seasons when they were not that good, they had played three consecutive Premier League finals and actually lost two of those three finals on penalties. So they were on the doorstep of title success and didn't, didn't quite make it. How expectant should they be here for this season and uh, the possibility of, of uh, winning their first title since, I think, 2006? Yeah, I, I think it, it's tough because, you know, as a sixth place team, it shows that, and, and just judging by the quality of the top five in the regular season, one might say that Waterhouse were far behind, but I think they caught some really good form towards the end of the regular season, ending the season on four wins because they were so close to Dumbo holding and Montego Bay United. People were saying it's a three-horse race, but Waterhouse managed that really well. Their defence has improved steadily as the season gone on, and the same th with their attack. I, I mentioned that how they attack Tivoli was very unique to what they had been doing all season and even in the second leg they started four attackers Andre Fletcher who usually plays on the right played more of an attacking midfield role they had Jibison on the right Rivaldo Mitchell on the left and Javain Bryan up top and I think if they're going to go at Mount Pleasant like that it would be very difficult for Mount Pleasant to maintain I'm not quite sure if they're going to but I think if a Waterhouse fan is expectant that they can go all the way they have a couple of you know omens to say that they could do it because, you know, the sixth place team in the Jamaica Premier League has at a couple of times surprised everyone and gone all the way to the final and won it. And Waterhouse have been on the other end of that a couple of times. And they, I'm sure they'll want to, you know, not be the, the team to spoil everything. But they're, they're playing like it and they could cause a shock. I'm not quite sure if they're going to cause a shock. And you said that I should be careful with my Mount Pleasant predictions because of Maria. So I'm not going to give one right now. Because of me. Yeah, because, you know, you're the big Mount Pleasant fan now. I'm surprised you're not wearing the jersey every day. But... You know, Nishi, we'll see. just because you've been commentating on every match and nobody has given you a jersey, you don't need to be mad at me for that. <laughs> I, I, I can't wear any jersey. I have to, I have to stay very... I have to stay very but you, the you thing know, is, yeah. it's Neutral. not even that. They don't want to give you any. Well, well, I beg to differ. 
I cannot say anything on Good here. Good comeback, though. But oh, I, I can't I, I, I wear big, any. I can't, I can't wear any. Sir, Sir Lance, But you don't no. have any. They didn't sir, give you any. Sir, 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 sir Lance, have no, you ever worn No, did Sir Lance get any? So the only person no, here that actually has a team and got shirts from the, from the team would be me. So don't be a hater. We have to go to break. <laughs> <laughs> this is a no-hater zone. <laughs> Bring time. Yeah, well, we still have a lot of football to come. And, of course, uh, we were in the Caribbean for the first segment. Now we go a few thousand miles across the Atlantic and tackle what has been happening in Europe in the past couple of hours. Back with more on The Zone after this.